There are many things you can do at an individual level to stop climate change. At least that's what the fossil fuel industry wants you to believe. They don't want us to take collective action or to vote or to get other people to vote. In this episode, we have Grace Nosek joining us. She is a climate storyteller, law student, climate activist, and the founder and director of the Climate Hub at the University of British Columbia. Grace, could you tell us a bit about yourself and what drew you into the world of sustainability? Sure. So uh, I, my name is Grace Nosek, and I'm getting my PhD in law at the University of British Columbia. Uh, but I guess the way I would describe myself most is a climate justice storyteller and organizer, and. I've been doing environmental justice or climate justice in various ways for more than a decade, and I've come to realize that I just love story in every capacity, and uh, that that's kind of what I want to be doing、uh, with my life. So, fusing all of these other things that I'm interested in with story has been、uh, such a delight.、Um, and yeah, I, it's always interesting when people ask. Me, who I am, because I'm trying to move away from the model of, like our titles or our work defining us. I, as you'll probably hear throughout this interview, I actually think that's like a key part of climate work is like really, really showing up as humans in a space and seeing other people as just, you know, other humans to be loved and connected with. Uh, and so I guess I'm gonna have to start really thinking about an answer of、uh, who I am without those other、uh, details that we usually use to share. But you know, a friend,、uh, a sister,、um, someone who wakes up every single day and is kind of like, how do I advance climate justice? Wow, that's a wonderful introduction. I feel like I have so much to learn just from that one introduction on how, like, so many different ways you can introduce introduce yourself. That's awesome. So you said you're you are really into storytelling,、um, and especially with、uh, climate change and things like that.、Um, and we know that you、uh, wrote a series of novels called Ava of the Gaia series, and it's a hopeful young adult climate fantasy.、Um, and the covers all for all three books look amazing. Congratulations on all of those.、Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about、uh, what got you into writing these stories and what you hope to achieve through the through the Ava of the Gaia series? Sure.、Um, I love that you think the covers are beautiful. They're by Sarah Carolyn. She's an incredible artist. You can find her online.、Um, I just think that people fundamentally care about other people and other beings, and then systems kind of tell them they shouldn't care or make them so busy or stressed or worried about their own existence. And、um, you know, teenagers, I think, still care a lot, and they haven't been told that that's idealistic or foolish, or they need to look elsewhere, or you know, gotten caught up in in some of those systems yet. And、uh, you know, Twilight was really popular just before I was thinking about writing mine because I wrote them right at the end of university, the first one, and. I this was a book that had captured hearts and minds around the world, and I wasn't I like you know, and I found it intriguing as well, but wasn't particularly impressed by the message of Twilight,、um, whatever it might be, like the values enshrined in the book. And I was just like, man, what if we could have Twilight, but like climate justice,、mm-hmm. <laughs> or you know.、Um, I think teens, especially, still have such a deep connection with animals and the natural world, and、um, kind of weaving those into story and and get people to think about,、um, you know,、uh, confined animal feeding operations, animal agriculture, these different things, and then you know, just <clears throat> of course injustice because we know climate change is the biggest human rights issue of our time, so. What communities are having to、uh, 
uh, bear the burden of that, but also to just make it joyful and not apocalyptic um, because there's so much joy in coming together with your friends to fight for this. And there's so much joy in like experiencing the natural world, however you do that. So also <laughs> classically in my life, a man told me women couldn't write. And I was like, okay, well, I better write a book. <laughs> oh, I like how you all really combined you know, all your passion, like Twilight, <laughs> and then your your work on sustainability into the same area. Yeah, I should clarify that Twilight was not necessarily one of my passions, although I was in- inspired by the way that it really, like, created this fervor. Like, people were fanatical about it. And why are people not this excited about, like, elections or land defenders? And I think that they could be uh, if those worlds were open to them and made accessible. I think it's a really good connection to make. And um, is that something that you've continued to update? Like, are you writing more books? What What have you been up to lately? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm writing so much, like so many kinds of story. I mean, particularly during the pandemic, um, I live alone. And so I just have like leaned into story as such an anchor. I should also mention, um, I wrote the books, uh, it's a trilogy, Ava of the Gaia, and I wrote them specifically to make them accessible. So all of the books are free as eBooks um, on whatever site you kind of download eBooks. Uh, so hopefully if you're interested in that or if you know young people who kind of want hope um, and, you know, young adult fantasy. <laughs> yeah, I am... Yeah, I'm writing a few more novels that I'm really excited about. They're not part of the same trilogy. One is actually really focused on um, unwinding toxic masculinity because I think toxic masculinity is one of the greatest drivers of climate injustice. And I think that, you know, that's an interesting conversation to have around sports as well. I think a lot of folks have been bringing up how Sports can be both a place where toxic masculinity kind of is inculcated, but also kind of create these atmospheres, depending on who sets the tone, where a different form of masculinity is um, kind of held up and centered. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's a novel I have out to agents right now, actually. And then I'm working on one about, well, actually, I might not say because it's so early. <laughs> Um, but I'm also writing some, (laughs) yeah, I'm writing some clients. Yeah, I guess at the end of university, I was actually very seriously injured in college. And so ended up with a lot of extra time and, you know, realized that I'd always enjoyed writing short stories or journaling and had this challenge from this dude that women couldn't write. And so then I started and I think only this year i knew that i love telling story like in every possible way and story weaves through our whole life in this world like everything is a story or can be but i realized that i'm that i like am in love like i love story it is so meaningful to me to create it and um to write it and think about it so that i think has been cool to to you don't even know it about yourself right like you discover it and then you discover maybe how how deeply it goes because I had kind of thought about it as like my way to fight climate and now I'm realizing it's these two threads right it's it is a way to fight climate but it's also something that I just like deeply deeply need as a human that's awesome. And um, you spoke a little bit about sports and sustainability. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. And, and we know you've done some work in the in the sports and sustainability field. Um, and you've done some things with athletes. So uh, do you want to tell us a bit about your involvement in sports and sustainability specifically? And what does sustainable sports mean mean to you? Sure. I think, I mean, I think it has to start with the fact that I played a lot of sports um, when I was younger and you spend so much time with a team and a coach. And um, then I got very, very seriously injured actually while I was playing soccer in university. So I have not played organized sports in a very long time, but they were very formative to my identity. And I had been working on this model 
from my research of climate activism, where essentially you, you train leaders in any community um, to effectively speak about uh, climate justice and action and what the problem is and what we can do about it. Because the most effective people to speak to communities are people who that community already trusts. And, and so the hub has started doing this and I've started doing this from my research of, okay, well, let's train all of those leaders in, in whatever communities they are and send them back to their communities um, to speak to them. But let, let's like, you know, give them a primer on what's happening and a primer on how to tell their stories. And also so much of what we tell people to do around climate is individual action. And I actually study how the fossil fuel industry has undermined climate narratives. So I know that individual action is actually what the fossil fuel industry wants us to do. They don't want us to take collective action or to vote or to get other people to vote. And so really shifting the framing about, you know, not, not only what is happening, what we can do about it, but like what are uh, some quite effective tactics. And, you know, you think about athletics, there is literally a team captain. <laughs> There's like literally a decided leader and they're so integrated and then they have so much reach beyond their circle. And so it was just such a natural fit. Um, and, you know, climate change has been really successfully politicized and that was, you know, a small group of conservative think tanks and people did that very um, purposefully because if it's politicized, then you can make people who should care about the future of the world think, oh, well, but that's not who I am. That's not how I vote. That's like not what my political group espouses. And sports, you know, have, I think this ability to bring folks together across some of these lines in society. Um, and so, yeah, I thought it was just a really interesting uh, place to play. And the other very cool thing about sports, essentially young people care more about climate change than anyone in any other age cohort. And they already know that it's a justice issue and they're deeply worried about it. And so my thought has also been like, okay, well, how do we get young people to then talk to their communities going vertically, going up? And again, sports are so wonderful for that because there are all ages playing and they tend to be like a densely connected network. Um, you know, like rugby players know the new rugby players, the hockey folks see the other hockey folks at the rink. And so, yeah, that's, it was just, let's, let's train these folks who want to. Obviously, we didn't make it mandatory. We just offered training and it was so cool. We, I went to, you know, the meeting of all the team captains, <laughs> you know, this climate organizer. Uh, it was the tallest group of people I've ever presented to. And I was just like, who, like, you know, we want to do this thing. We care about climate justice. We're going to make this film. And I loved it. It just like broke through all the stereotypes immediately. Like a football player was like, yes, we'll do it. Our team will love this. Um, and I thought that was so important, especially because you usually see like skiers or surfers, people who are like connected, quote unquote, to these natural places for their sports. But I was like, let's have football players and basketball players um, talk about climate like how interesting would that be how different to show that this isn't just like you know snow melting so let's worry about it as skiers but like every human on this planet is threatened by climate change yeah i think um for today even you know it's it's a lot easier to connect these athletes to the the climate the whole climate issue because you know it's affecting their sports it's affecting a lot of what they're caring about so I just want to ask, like, from your experience working with athletes, was there any kind of misconception that these athletes had about s sustainable practices? Well, uh, you know, no misconceptions. I thought they were incredibly savvy and thoughtful and, you know, driven to, to be doing, taking on this work on top of these wild schedules that they had. But like almost every other person in in 
the world. <laughs> they have been taught from birth uh, that environmental citizenship is recycling. And that narrative is so pervasive. And of course, we need people to care about the resources that they use. There are various reasons why doing some of those things can be wonderful. They can set an example. I, I do things that could be considered individual actions. I'm, I'm vegan. You know, I try not to fly. One of the big things I do is I just don't buy anything firsthand. One of the reasons I love that is it saves me a lot of money. And so I, I buy myself more time to be involved in other things. So of course there are reasons to do those things, but actually the best thing you can do on climate if you have 10 minutes is vote. The next best thing you can do if you have like 20 minutes is get five of your friends to vote. And I'm being purposefully vague because it's literally any election you can think of. Like your high school election, your college election, your um, city election, province, municipal. So, so, so few students um, get access to vote in these places or reminded or, you know, that's a whole another conversation. One I would love to have with you folks, because one of my big focus with athletes has been getting their peers to vote. Um, but, you know, the other thing that you can do is call your bank and tell them to stop funding, you know. But people spend hours, hours, and I've been one of these people, you know, standing in the store being like, is this the light bulb that like reduces the energy? Or is it this one? Or should I? Ugh? And it's so much energy that that ta is taken from you and that's exactly what these companies want they want you to think it's your fault they want you to blame other people and they want you to spend your energy which none of us have a lot of in this kind of neoliberal grind on trying to figure out like can i recycle this and recycling is another false narrative pushed by the fossil fuel industry so we just need this massive push to say Actually, like electing climate justice champions, supporting land defenders, supporting indigenous sovereignty, that's climate action. You know, these other things, yes, we can do, but that's climate action. Wow, that, that was very inspiring and very thought provoking also to, to realize that, you know, it's the problem is more, it's a systema systematic problem. There's a lot of different parts of it that are intertwined together. That are that are making it difficult for us to, to fight against some of these problems that we're facing. Oh, I just want to give the basic example because I'm a, I am a lawyer, um, so lawyers are kind of all familiar with this. But just to give an example of why taking collective action over individual, because if if as a country we get together and we say let's get rid of plastic, and the government mandates that nobody can sell plastic anymore, that is the game changer, you know? And then people have to come up with creative other uses rather than you sitting there as a consumer, you know, trying to sort this through, then watching other people, you know, mess up your garbage so that, that it doesn't actually get there. And, and you can spend your time, you know, advocating at that system to get the legislation passed. Um, and what I see is, so I'm this chapter I'm working on right now is that the fossil fuel industry has spent so many billions of dollars blocking government climate action at every possible level in so many countries. The kind of action that is, you know, it just is so much more impactful than what we can do as individuals. Um, and so, yeah, really kind of coming back in this organized way to say, we know what you're doing. Um, we have our own stories and we're going to act systemically as well. I think that's a very good perspective because I think individual actions and collective action has always been like the two, like a big debate topic. And um, I think if you do it individually, you kind of really get influence about, around, about the voices around you. And then you see that, you know, there are people who are not taking action, so your action wouldn't help. So that like all of this really affects your motivation to take on these climate actions. So um, just want to bring it back to uh, how do you think athletes themselves could take on sustainable practices 
And have you in- tried to encourage them in some way? Yeah, to, oh, I mean, I think there like are so said, many ways. Right? Um, I myself, along with the hub, Uh, organized a climate ambassador workshop for athletes. And so we had kind of 60 varsity athletes come out and learn about, you know, some of what the fossil fuel industry has done, some of the social science on effective climate framing, which is really that like we are, we are also powerful in, in telling stories to the people that we care about in we are the best climate messengers in the world to our own communities. And we are the best at getting those people to vote. There is no one who has more power over them than we do. Um, And yeah, just like hope is really important. Agency, framing this as a justice issue. You know, also just like people are terrified. They are so scared. And I, so I think it's a moral prerogative to give people a hope that they'll have a future, particularly young people. So that was incredible. And then obviously we made the video, uh, which I'm so proud of. And it took an incredible team of people. Um, If you do check out the video, which hopefully you folks will link to it, um, look at all the athletes who were in it. um, Look at how many people collaborated uh, and came together on this project. And it, it was such a cool fusing of worlds of, athletes and and climate justice. But I think what athletes can do, and this will be no surprise, (laughs) is, you know, the most effective thing I can think they can do is um, speak out about climate justice and talk about what the fossil fuel industry has done, remind people that this is a justice issue and get them to vote for climate justice champions and, you know, support indigenous land defenders. And so for an example, Uh, LeBron James uh, did a ton of work around getting out the vote in the 2020 U.S. election Um, and I think was able to broker deals to start using like sports arenas as places where people could vote. And I think that's an incredible way to do this. Um, And, you know, I mentioned toxic masculinity. There's actually some research around like it's been inculcated that it's like kind of a soft thing to care about climate or to wear a mask or that, you know, makes you feminine in some way. And so I think I'm so moved by these men. Um, I mean, I'm so moved by the women in athletics who have done incredible things for progressive politics, like, and have been doing them forever. And we know that black athletes have been forever, um, talking about uh, racial justice and 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 lo- there's a long tradition but I've been really moved in the past year um, by these men who are obviously really kind of held up as figures of masculinity who in opposition to kind of like a Donald Trump figure are expanding the idea of what masculinity is and I think athletes have a particular role to play and 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 are kind of given the space it's not easy for them. You know, we saw, uh, Colin Kaepernick get horribly and unjustly public, uh, like, uh, punished and and lose his job for speaking out. But, um, yeah, I think it's, that's a really cool thing that folks can do. That's awesome. And I, I think you put it really well that, you know, when people, um, that are already in the limelight, they use their position and the resources they have to bring attention to things like, you know, you gave the example of LeBron James. He, he brought attention to the uh, idea of voting and he was uh, endorsing arenas to, you know, be a place for, where people can come and vote. Um, and then similarly, you say with athletes, the best thing that they can do is, is speak up about it and talk about it and, you know, raise awareness among their peers. Um, and that leads you to the film that you spoke about, Climate Comeback, which is so gorgeously captured all the strengths, um, the courage and the team spirit that, that sports inspires. Um, and I honestly don't think anybody could have done a better job with a video like that. It was very remarkable. So congratulations on that. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the creative process, about how you got to making the video, the thought process throughout the production and how long it took uh, for the whole production to, to be complete? Yeah, absolutely. And at the very first, I should say that Um, the video was my idea, but I had no role in the actual editing, filming. We had such an incredible team. And again, you can see that in the credits under the film, but I will just name a few folks. Avery Holiday was an incredible cinematographer. 
um, and they have really shaped their career around doing justice projects and climate justice projects. So that's incredible. Like another example of how you can kind of take whatever role you have in society and say, okay, I'm going to do this role, but I'm going to do it plus climate justice. <laughs> um, Kat Jamie and Josephine Anderson, um, two super badass female directors, uh, came in and helped. Liv Yoon was incredible. Aspen Ono. Um, and so, yeah, I had this idea of talking about this in terms of a, a, a sports comeback because, you know, people really have lost hope on climate. And again, this is actually a narrative push by the fossil fuel industry. I wish I could show everyone my research, but they're doing that because they know the psychology that people who don't feel like they have power don't act against it. And so if you disempower people, if you make them feel helpless, they won't do anything to stop or to change. Um, and so, but like, you know, my dad every weekend, I think the I'm from Philadelphia and the Eagles were doing really well one year and every weekend he would just be like, and Grace, like the ball bounced here and it was unbelievable and Hail Mary pass and they came back and they triumphed. And I was like, oh yeah, everyone in the world knows these wild comeback stories. They understand that in terms of sports. So how can we take this metaphor that is like deeply understood and revered by people who might not be talking about climate change that much and, and bring it to them? And then it was really beautiful because a lot of the athletes wanted to talk about uh, comeback in terms of injury and some of them in terms of catastrophic injury. And I think that is, again, this human story that let's hold up, let's hold up how good we are at coming back from things. Um, and that it's hard and there's suffering and there's grief. And there has been tremendous grief and suffering already caused by climate change, always for the most marginalized communities. And we see that over and over and over again. So to acknowledge that, but to really get people to feel like, but there's something we can do. And then you could see that we, we use the three Vs at the end, um, which we've kind of been using to replace the three R's or in addition to the three R's or five R's or however many R's you learned that there were. Um, but just to think about what are the systemic actions you can take and systemic actions that are actually quite easy to do. And so, yeah, we have the three V's, which are voice, your climate concerns to friends and family, vote and volunteer. Um, and in part, that's because many folks who would be our parents' age are not that worried about climate. They believe it's happening. They believe it's human caused, um, but they're not that worried and they don't vote um, in terms of climate. Whereas I can't think of anything that I'm more worried about. And I, you know, climate is, shapes ex totally who I would vote for and support. And when an election comes around, I just, I talk to every single person that I know everywhere. And I, and I you know, ask them what they care about and, and that's systemic action, um, you know, or I share information about and donate money to land defenders and that's systemic action, a collective action. Yeah, I think you're, I think the film was one of the most impactful work I've seen around climate change. And, you know, sports really triggers that emotion, which should be channeled towards um, more climate action. Um, do you believe that sports and sustainability is a relatively new and unexplored topic? Yeah. Um, I, so as you can see, I don't usually use the term sustainability. And, you know, language, there are a lot of, you know, I think requiring certain kinds of language or wanting certain kinds of language can be quite classist. So I don't use it because of, you know, I'm not emphatic about not using it, but to me, this is, this is really a justice story. Um, and so it's kind of like, that's what I always choose to center when I'm talking about the issue. Um, and I think there's such a long line of justice and sports together. And so to me, this is kind of just like the natural outgrowth of that. And, you know, I, I'm, stretching back more than a century, we've seen athletes take immense personal risk to use the world stage that they're given to stand up for justice. 
And I think we're, you know, some teams, it was amazing to see them stand for Black Lives Matter, like really earnestly um, and specifically. And, you know, the other side has a massive narrative advantage in the sense that they have so much money. And so we kind of have to counter it by just having the collective will and spirit and getting everyone on board and and telling the same, pushing back against those narratives with the same narratives that actually we can do this. There's hope. We're all important to the fight. One of the most important things for us is that we just kind of love and connect and build joyful community Um, and that we can do it. We, we are the solution. Um, so that's what I, yeah, I'm, I, I think it's not new in a way. And then, of course, it's awesome to see the stadiums do solar power and these other things. But what I love really is the chains and the people and the coaches and the players who are saying, no, you know, we stand for justice um, and you can't silence us. That's very powerful. And, and I, I really hope that, that, you know, like athletes are able, athletes and, and anybody even related to the sports field, are, they're able to realize that they can also dive into climate action and it's not actually as difficult as it may, as it may seem sometimes. So given your background in law and you've had a lot of involvement with climate action, um, these are two s- seemingly separate fields that you've managed to bring together. Um, do you have any advice for people that are not in this climate change or sustainability field directly, but they'd like to find a way to be a part of it? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I have ADHD. And so for me, nothing is separate. And I've never understood things being separate they kind of all just blend in my mind which has I think been a real gift in part for my climate advocacy um but I think everyone who is working to make this world more just and make and kinder to other humans is doing climate work you know and if you're from a group of people that is has been oppressed by so many different systems honestly, just surviving and like nourishing yourself, that's climate work. And I know that sounds, you know, people want the actual actions and maybe I'll list a few. (laughs) Um, But I, it's, it's a genuine belief. Like I, I really take the time to nourish myself. And I think because I was catastrophically injured, I had to set boundaries and, and kind of let my body tell me when I was done But what that lets me do is show up in other spaces to nourish people and listen to them and not get defensive and and really try to hold up other voices and meet people where they are. And, you know, like I was saying, I think we start as children and and teens and we we don't we we walk by injustice and we're upset about it and then we want to do something. And literally, I think systems tell us, look away, you know, it's that person's fault or there's nothing we can do, you know, because they have to rationalize why the system is continuing, like how you could see such misery um, and human suffering and just, you know, not care, keep doing what you're doing. And so I think the more that we just say, actually, I'm I'm going to look and I'm going to try and do my best wherever I can to just be as kind as possible, as thoughtful to all beings. That to me is the climate future. And, you know, I'm really interested in universal basic income where maybe if we just had the time to connect and build connection and do the things that we care about um, and find meaning through art and music and these other things, We would not need consumption as much. We would not need to hurt each other as much. We would care more when other animals and humans were hurt. Because I don't lay it at the feet of humans. It's really, really hard to be a human in this day and age. And I, you know, I'm really empathetic to folks your age. I'm a little bit older than you. um, To just how many pressures there are. And it feels like, 
okay, well, if I don't do, if I don't get an A in this class, then I'm not going to get the internship I want. And if I don't get that internship, I'm not going to be able to get this job. And I have so much debt and, you know, maybe whatever country I live in doesn't pay for my health care and I have family members responsible. And so you really get stuck. Like, how can you care? How can you take the time for these other things? Uh, so I have deep empathy for that. And it's why I think that people with more privilege have to take more risk. And I have some privilege in this world um, uh, with my education and I'm a white cis woman. So I try to take the risks that I can, disrupt the power structures that I can, and just show up and love and affirm people as deeply as I can. And it, it works. I like how you said that um, we're only human, you know, there's, we shouldn't beat ourselves up for, over this. And there's always somebody who has more power, who can just do more. And I just want to, I just want to go back to like, what's your take on the changes that will occur to sporting events after COVID? Yeah, I mean, this I have I have to say, I have no expertise on what's going to happen. Um, my hope is that somehow this becomes a moment where we democratize sports more, where we hold up women's sport um, and change what is seen as the best sport and who the money makers are. Um, but I, I have no idea. I, I have a friend who's supposed to be going to the Olympics and they have no idea what's happening there or not. Uh, so I know it's, it's a tricky moment. Um, but as with everything, I would just love for it to be, become a space where there's more connection and more joy. And I guess I will say for tangible activities, if you have any disposable income, supporting climate protesters or land defenders or water protectors. And that's because these these folks are taking the ultimate risks and they're not doing it for themselves. This is why it's so wild to me when people get mad at them, so angry because they're risking everything, their livelihoods, their bodies, their lives, so that the rest of us can have cleaner air and cleaner water and so that we might have children who can enjoy those things as well. And truly, some of these folks have nothing, no money, and and they're still doing this instead of, you know, taking, uh, you know, doing what we're all doing in this system, which is trying to survive. They've stepped outside of that and they're trying to, you know, change the system so that we can all thrive. So that's a very tangible thing and make sure that you always share those stories and those calls. And again, I just I just released a paper, which you can look up about how the fossil fuel industry has spent so much time and money and energy targeting climate protesters and backing bills um, to crack down on them. Uh, so you folks maybe can link to that. Um, but just another example of how they have so shaped the systems we're playing inside. And then just make climate joyful. Like if you have a friend that you love seeing, pick something to do together for climate. Like everything that I love in life, I've just like added climate to it. And so my climate work is the most joyful, meaningful, light work. It's how I meet people. It's how I... You know, we always have a dance party at the hub when we have a climate event. And uh, yeah, just I think find that community, do it together and center justice and, and elections. We, we've got to start electing climate justice champions and there's going to be a municipal election soon. And it's very clear who the climate justice champions are and, and who is not. And when I say climate justice, you know, it's all those systems bundle up, white supremacy, colonialism, heteropatriarchy. So it's what's cool about that is someone who is a climate justice champion by nature has to want to disrupt those other systems. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. It's a very it's a very complex thing with a lot of layers to address, and sometimes it can be a little bit difficult and overwhelming. But like you said, you know, if you add climate to different aspects of your life, and and you think about it in different aspects of your life, it actually can become a very a joyful journey when when you're on this journey of of climate action, which is really inspiring. Yeah. Literally, the most easy thing you can do is just have a conversation with your parents the next time. There's research showing that people, like we think people are talking about climate all the time. Outside of a certain bubble, people are almost not talking about it at all. Teachers very rarely teach it. And so, you know, just just chatting, like this means something to me. I, I need you to care about it as well. I told my <laughs> parents that I would not give them a grandkid unless they stepped up the fight to <laughs> create a world where, you know, a grand could, could thrive. And so they're, they've never been the most kind of traditionally politically active, uh, but they really did it. I'm American, so they really stepped up in the last election. And I, I made it like very, very personal. You know, I said like this, I can't sleep at night. Like I need you to do this with me for my health. That's amazing. That's so inspiring. I think just maybe starting some of those conversations, even at a very basic level, they can go a really long way. Um, so that's awesome. Um, so is there anything that you'd like to share with our audience, our listeners, or anything you'd like to specifically say to the UBC community regarding climate action, climate change, sports, sustainability, anything of those of that sort? I guess first I would just like to thank you folks because, um, you know, you're volunteering your time. This is literally exactly what I've just said. You're making it joyful. You're doing it together. Um, you're going to tell a story that lots of different people will hear. Uh, so I'm deeply impressed by that um, and impressed by you both. And it, I know it has not been an easy year for people in university and I guess just like, I, I see you, I hear you. Like I, this is the broader community. Like I, I see you. It's really, really, really hard to be human right now. And to ask someone what seems like to like lead a movement. Um, but I promise you it's, it's not that it's just orienting towards justice and starting the conversations and you know, I know what will happen. Any of you out there who are interested, if you just take the first step of showing up at a meeting or going to an event or asking a friend if you can do something together, registering to vote, registering other folks to vote, the next come really quickly and easily. It's always the first step that's the hardest. Um, but definitely take a little bit less of that energy if you're like really focused on recycling and doing these other things, like give yourself a little break and maybe write to one of your representatives or call your bank. Um, and there's a bunch more info uh, on the fossil fuel industry, what they're doing at, at my website, gracenosick.com, um, because I think that's a really important part of the story. And we need to start telling it. And it's it, the tobacco industry, you know, pioneered this thing of, um, creating doubt around the science around smoking and hundreds of millions of people died. Um, and the fossil fuel industry has worked to manufacture doubt around climate and then lots and lots of other narratives. And so we need to recognize that they have kind of created the playing field that we are playing on. And I guess this is a sports analogy. I'm kind of like, no, we're not going to play on your field. We're not going to play by your rules. We're not going to play the game you've decided. We're going over here. <laughs> we're going to play our own. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's how I would end it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us your perspective on like voting, climate justice, and Black Lives Matter. And I think the world needs more people like you who are at the center and really just trying to influence people in so many different pers from so many different perspectives. So yeah, thank you for joining us today. If you're listening to this podcast and haven't done so already, make sure you check out gracenozak.com for more of Grace's work on her novel, podcast, and the climate comeback short film.